is CBC Here and Now. And then I noticed a little security car in front of the police vehicle, and I was like, damn. And then I looked over, seen the excavator inside the building, I'm like, oh my God. Obviously, it's, you know, it's the same guy that's doing this. I mean, this is somebody with history on operating equipment. Three times lucky? Another attempted robbery using heavy machinery. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, they say things happen in threes. And not good things. For the third time in a week, thieves used heavy machinery to break into a business. This time, it was in Conception Bay South. They used a John Deere excavator to tear off the canopy over the drive through ATM area of the Scotiabank in Long Pond and then smash in the wall. Now, it appears they failed to get the cash and it's not clear yet whether anything was stolen during the cleanup today. The bank machine could be seen in the rubble. On Sunday, a front end loader was used to break into a TD bank in St. John's. And a day later, a backhoe crunched through four windows at the Sobeys on Kelsey Drive, and the ATM there was stolen. The string of robberies combined with the ease of stealing heavy machinery has prompted calls for contractors to take preventative measures. One snowplowing contractor believes whoever is behind these robberies knows how to operate heavy machinery. Doing this, I mean, this is somebody with history on operating equipment because. You know, a loader and a backer are one thing, but to operate an excavator is a different type of a, a bird altogether. You know, this is a bigger machine, and uh, luckily, he ended up breaking the hose on the machine and didn't end up getting the ATM out of the building right here. What's this stuff about the one key fits all? I mean, doesn't that seem kind of foolish? Well, it's pretty, you know, companies have big fleets. If you have 10 or 15 pieces of John Deere equipment, so you have a universal key. Right. That makes it nice and easy. Nice and easy for everybody. Nice and easy for everybody, unfortunately. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary's top police officer is facing a harassment complaint. Chief Joe Boland confirmed a, un, a uniformed officer has made a complaint against him. But as here and now as Mark Quinn reports, that investigation is currently on hold. Chief Joe Boland didn't shy away from CBC's TV camera. Hey, look, I'm not immune to an officer making a complaint against me. Uh, in this case here, it's a harassment complaint. It's, uh, it's in relation to an internal investigation. Sources say the complaint is not sexual in nature, and it was launched by a veteran officer who is himself facing an internal disciplinary investigation. The provincial government's Human Resources Secretariat will investigate the complaint against Bolin, but speaking after a rotary lunch in St. John's, Boland says the HRS investigation is not moving forward right now. They decide, it's not I, that uh, that particular uh, complaint will be investigated after the internal disciplinary investigation is completed. Um, you know, and I welcome that. So is there anything to the complaint against Boland? Well, Boland says it wouldn't be appropriate for him to comment until the investigation is completed. But he did say he's looking forward to putting this whole matter behind him. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Bad Bones Ramen is back in business, but why did one of the city's favorite new restaurants close in the first place? And can it work the second time around? That story is coming up on Here and Now. It has been a 16-month, $10 million ordeal for the MV Gallipoli and the people in Ramia and Gray River cost escalations and delays, a shipyard mishap, and an eventual bankruptcy. Yes, but the Gallipoli has been practically rebuilt and will soon be ferrying people, vehicles, and freight once again. Here and now's Terry Roberts reports. He's skippered the Gallipoli for 19 years. He can't wait to show off this new look vessel to his hometown of Ramia and nearby Gray River. Well, I'm sure it'll be a happy reaction. Everybody's going to be happy. Everybody's waiting for it. Been waiting a long time. Here she is, freshly painted, almost ready to be put back in service. We're looking at uh, we're looking at in the next next week or two. Engines rebuilt, a new thruster, elevator, steel repairs, even some new flooring. You know, this is going to extend the life of this vessel maybe 20 to 30 years. Much of the work done right here at this St. John's shipyard, but it's been anything but smooth sailing. The Gallipoli came out of service in September 2017. The original plan, a 90-day refit here at the Bury Shipyard in Clarenville. Budget, less than $2 million. Problems from the start. Unexpected corrosion drove up the cost and threw off the schedule. 
Then this, the Gallipoli stalled on a marine railway at Bury's last winter. Three million in damages. That put us in a place where nobody would have wanted to be. After weeks of controversy and investigation, government canceled its contract with Bury's and the yard eventually closed. The vessel was towed to St. John's where costs again went over budget. Total bill, 10 million, though 3 million will be recovered through an insurance claim related to the damage in Clarenville. You know, we were able also to roll in what would have been a 2018-19 uh, refit into this refit. I feel good. Uh, the, the work here in St. John's do not has been excellent. I mean, we got a pretty good vessel. We're quite happy with her now. So when you think 15, 16 months that people have been waiting to get their regular uh, boat back, uh, it's going to make a big difference. With good weather, it will take about 24 hours to steam the Gallipoli to Ramia, but only after final certification is complete and when this man gives the go-ahead. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, uh, taking a look at the forecast over the weekend, we are in a continuation of the roller coaster that we've been on for the past week or so. Big change uh, in temperatures as we head towards Monday. Light snow the story for tonight and through Newfoundland tomorrow, at least through the first half of the day. Then it looks like the sun should come out and then everything changes on Sunday afternoon. We are going to start to see some snow move in. Everything changes over to rain by Monday morning. We could see 20 to 40 degree temperature swings in some cases. January thaw very much on the way for Monday. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, dozens of red dresses were hung in Glenwood today. Lisa John and Simone Bone say they have displayed more than 100 pieces of red clothing to show support for Con River and the family of Chantel John. The dresses are hung up in Glenwood along the Trestle Bridge and on the Trans-Canada Highway. The women say they're hoping it brings attention to the issue of violence against women. Vincent Belanger Dompierre, the Labrador City man accused of killing, I should say Vincent Belanger Dompierre is the person who was killed and the person accused of that will stay in custody until a judge decides whether or not to let him out of bail. Vince Ward is charged with first degree murder in the death of 28 year old Dompierre. The Montrealer was found dead inside a Labrador City home last April. Police believe the men knew each other. Ward pleaded not guilty today. The judge said a decision on Ward's bail will be made on February the 7th. Brandon Cody has pleaded guilty to attempted murder. He's admitted to stabbing Taylor King last February when he went into a St. John's apartment. And that apartment belonged to a woman that Cody had dated. According to an agreed statement of facts that was read in court this morning, Cody saw King with the woman and started stabbing him. He received multiple deep wounds to his chest, arms and leg. Cody told the court that he has anxiety and is on medication. He was drinking the night of the stabbing and he says that he had no intention of killing anyone, but he admits that he did it and now the court has to decide on his sentence. There's legal trouble brewing over a new lift bridge that officially opened in Placentia more than two years ago. The company that built this bridge is now going to court saying the province caused problems getting the work done and the company should be paid more. Bird Heavy Civil Limited is suing the government for eight and a half million dollars. The company says the holdups meant the work was finished 18 months later than expected. Those claims haven't been proven and neither side is talking, saying the matter is before the court. Some teachers on the island were schooled in first aid today. They learned new heart pumping skills to bring back to their classrooms in CBS, Mount Pearl, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips and Fairyland. The program means about a thousand grade nine students will learn life saving skills this year as a result of today. In grade nine, they're mature enough to take those skills and use them. And I feel like if you can make a number of students in our school comfortable with those skills, if anything happens in the school, then they will be comfortable enough to deal with the situation. Once we complete it in, in class, they'll get a little certificate saying they've been trained in CPR and AED use. So it's something for them to kind of have on the resume when applying for jobs, which is an important job skill to understand. And also, it, uh, you never know when they're going to need it. It could be a parent or a grandparent at home or a younger sibling where they may have to react quickly to help save them. A lot of people probably uh, shy away from, you know, situations because they lack the knowledge. So, you know, if we can bring that to them, um, I think it'll be positive and they'll be more likely to uh, get involved. 
I think it's an essential skill when you're talking about a life-saving skill. Uh, you know, it's important for us as teachers to have that, but to be able to deliver that to our kids, I think, is going that extra step. Attempt the first breath. Attempt the second breath. Our schools are going to be getting the mannequins as well as um, some AED kits as well. If you haven't got that equipment, the chances of someone surviving is diminished, down to almost 5%. With an AED and with people trained, we call it the chain of survival. It can be anywhere from 85 to 95 percent success rate. It makes a difference. Bad Bones Ramen makes a great bowl of soup, but does it have the recipe for a successful business? The St. John's restaurant stunned diners in December when it abruptly shut down despite being consistently crowded with customers. Now Bad Bones has reopened with a big assist from Bob Hallett. Here now Zach Gowdy has more. A bowl of ramen looks simple. Noodles, veggies and broth. But in reality, it's a complex dish with many ingredients. It's a lot like running a business. Seem simple, sell a thing that people want. Bad Bones Ramen was doing exactly that, yet somehow the popular restaurant had to shut down late last year. What it came down to was that buying so many fresh ingredients is so expensive, and then the overhead of the rent and the bills, it's just it just became impossible. Now, Bad Bones is back. When the old place closed, the owners got a call from Bob Hallett, whose own restaurant, Tavola, had also recently shut down. It's kind of like, uh, we are, we're closing the place down, and uh, he's like, hey, why are you closing that place? It's doing so well. Hey, let's check out this place. Check out, i got a restaurant next door. It's been closed for a while. And that's how essentially it happened. Got us in here. Me and great guy. We're full of encouragement. And, and he uh, cares about the city. Yeah, he does he, care about the know. city, absolutely. Tavola and Bad Bones were two of several downtown restaurants to close last year. The reluctant chef, Fifth Ticket, and others became casualties of a slowing economy. Add to that the rising cost of food and rent in downtown St. John's, and many restaurants are getting squeezed out. Bad Bones says Hallett is giving them a good deal, so they're happy to try again. They wish other businesses could get a break, too. It's becoming a problem. I mean, I heard of another restaurant um, downtown who recently shut down because of the high rent cost and the landlord wouldn't budge on the price. And why would they rather have an empty building rather than offering a reasonable rent? Since Bad Bones reopened this week, the place is, once again, packed. But even if it stays that way, uncertainty for downtown businesses is hanging in the air like the smell of a good bowl of ramen. And That's at right. the end of the day, if it doesn't work, then we... Well, we, we did our best. Yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we did our best. We've yeah. done our best. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Brook had mild temperatures, heavy rain, and a just a mess in the city this time last year. Even a state of emergency was declared. We'll check in on the rebuild. So that piece of heavy machinery was basically the tool used to get the job done. The thieves, the crooks, were after that ATM, which is right there. And they didn't get the money, but they made one heck of a mess here in CBS. It's almost like recon these guys are doing. You know, it's like they're doing their, they're doing preliminary looks during the day and then come back at night and doing the jobs they want to hit. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, side streets and main roads turned to rubble in Corner Brook this time last year. The January flood caused major structural damage and the city is still rebuilding. And now mild weather and rain in the forecast has the West Coast City on standby for another major flood. Here Now's Colleen Connors has more. Main streets turned to rivers in January 2018. Uh, the worst spots were the upper west side, so uh, Boone's Road, uh, Walburn's Road, Reed's Road, uh, where all the all the water coming off the new subdivisions up in Sunny Slope and uh, Carberry's Road, that water filtered down through these uh, storm systems and uh, caused significant damage. Water levels were dangerously high in the streams. The city declared a state of emergency. It was chaos. We had boulders out in the road. Uh, it's not safe for people to be out there. And we had flooded areas where you could trap additional people at any time. Like most West Coast areas, the city applied for some disaster relief funding, but didn't get what they needed. We applied for a significant amount of money. I think it was over $2 million. Um, and that, I guess, reconstruction hasn't been completed yet. We ended up getting about a quarter million, as it turned out. That chunk of money will go towards permanently fixing ditches and roads this construction season. The provincial government relief fund paid over two million to private sectors and about half a million to municipalities on the west coast for January flood damage. More than 20 communities needed help with repair. This is one of the worst areas hit in Corner Brook because of last year's storms. Water was just gushing down Reed's Road, leaving a huge mess. Now, most of it is buried right now under all this snow, but a permanent fix is coming this spring. The big concern now is the weather in the forecast for the coming days. We've got mild temperatures and heavy rain coming to Corner Brook, and that has staff on high alert. We've been watching the weather very closely for the past week and uh, we have started some preparations, uh, widening roads, cleaning storm systems, uh, checking our head walls, getting our trucks ready with sandbags, making more sandbags. So, you know, we're looking at the weather, we're preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. The city is ready and waiting for Monday's messy storm and hoping that it's not a repeat of last year. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed that they don't face that again on the West Coast because mm -hmm. that means you and I will be hitting the road again like <laughs> yeah. last year. Now, before we get to the weather, early in the week, Carolyn, you introduced everybody watching here and now to Michael Windsor. Mm -hmm. He's the photographer who captured that stunning and by now very famous picture of an iceberg floating in uh, Fairyland. Yes, it's so spectacular that Canada Post has put the photo on a stamp. And today in St. John's, there was a small event to mark that. In a series that features some of Canada's most beautiful landscapes, and of course, there's no shortage of those here. And today, Canada Post staff and the province's tourism minister presented a framed photo of the image to the deputy mayor of Fairyland, Harry Bryant. So you go, a nice addition to the walls of the town hall there. Mm. It is gorgeous. It is mm -hmm. lovely. Yeah. yeah. Now, we've got a package of those stamps. Um, do you have them? I don't have them. Okay, they, uh, they're here the somewhere. This is this is one of the most generous prizes we've ever given away. So security guards have been hired, and they're back there guarding uh, the stamps. We're going we're going to give them away, but not before putting you through a, a bit of a bit of work. Yes. Yeah, you got to answer a skill testing question first. That photographer, Michael Windsor, has 3,500 of his photos on display somewhere in the province. Where are they? Okay, so that's the question. Now, the first person to tweet me that answer will get the stamps. And uh, my Twitter handle is at CStokesCBC. And just a hint, uh, if you're stumped, you can go to the cbc.ca slash NL website, and uh, you'll probably find the answer there in the web story. Just maybe. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and we'll get those stamps to you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So how are things looking? It's Friday. It's an important forecast right now. It is. It's the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, we're almost there. Wow. Temperatures uh, much colder today. Yeah. Right across the board mm -hmm. down into the minus double digits in some cases. Take a look at the current temperatures right now uh, sitting at 
minus 10 through Badger. So generally sitting between minus 7 and minus 10, a little bit warmer down through the south coast. St. Lawrence sitting at minus 5. And Labrador has warmed up a little bit today, sitting at minus 25, minus 27 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Maine, still sitting at minus 29. Now those wind chills still sitting in the minus 20 degree range. And uh, we're going to see the temperatures drop like a rock tonight, uh, especially for the western portion of Labrador. And that's why we still have an extreme cold warning in place place likely going to see these uh, cold warnings off and on right through the weekend as we continue on that roller coaster ride of temperatures as I've been mentioning for the past little bit. So taking a look at the satellite and radar, not a whole lot happening today. Uh, we did see a little bit of flurry activity along the west coast and we'll uh, see that continue as we head through the night tonight if we take a look at that future tracker. So we will see a little bit of a system move through. The center is actually going to push through Labrador. So we're going to see uh, light snow spreading right across the province and along the south coast as well. Eventually by the time the morning rolls around temperatures will be hovering around the zero degree mark. We're actually going to see an increase in temperatures by morning, uh, especially around the Buren Peninsula and the Avalon. So that's where we'll likely see a change over to a brief period of either wet snow or showers into the afternoon that could extend as far as Clarenville as we head through tomorrow afternoon. Otherwise, in behind that we drop with those temperatures again as that ridge of high pressure becomes uh, more prevalent. Could see some lingering onshore flurries in the early afternoon and then eventually things will taper off with uh, clear skies for the most part into the evening on Saturday. But as I mentioned, those temperatures are going to drop. So here's a look at the forecast for tonight. Generally sitting in uh, the minus double digits to start. So minus 10 should be the after or the overnight low rather for the Avalon or at least parts of the Avalon. And then temperatures are going to climb quite drastically by morning to about minus 4. And that's what we're going to see along uh, for parts of Central and up through the Northern Peninsula as well. Minus 6 should be your morning high for St. Anthony or morning low rather. And then the temperatures will continue to climb through the day. Port of Basque minus one. We are still looking at that potential for flurries right across the board through the night tonight and then up through Labrador. Temperatures are going to drop, as I mentioned, like a rock for Labrador City. Minus 33 should be your overnight low. Otherwise, those temperatures will climb as we head towards the coast. So minus 16 by morning for Cartwright, minus 10 for the Straits. And then we get into that southerly flow and the winds will eventually ease. So as far as snowfall goes, good trace to five centimeters is possible. Possible. Uh, locally higher amounts for western Labrador and then along the west and south coast as well. We could see that reaching the 10 degree mark. But into the afternoon tomorrow, temperatures, as I mentioned, hovering around zero for central towards Avond uh, at the Avalon, uh, hitting the above zero mark. So we could see everything change over to rain. And then temperatures up through Labrador sitting in the minus 20s. Lab City, beautiful tomorrow, but cold again, minus 29. Those wind chills still feeling closer to minus 45. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead at that warm up. Up, I keep talking about when I come back. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Well, another hydraulic heist this time in CBS. It's the third heavy machinery smash and grab in less than a week. Gives a new meaning to hitting a bank, and this time it was Scotia Bank on the main drag in CBS, and that's where I met up with heavy equipment and excavator expert Sean Roach. Well, this is the excavator, which happened to be here on a job, and the crooks, they took advantage of that to actually try to rob the Scotia Bank that's just behind us here. Police station is actually not that far, about 500 feet that way. Sean Roach is in this business. What's your sense of what happened here? Well, obviously, it's, you know, it's the same guy that's doing this. I mean, it's, it's somebody with history on operating equipment because, you know, a loader and a backer are one thing, but to operate an excavator is a different type of a, a bird altogether. So this guy is absolutely an operator. So, uh, He's getting desperate. You know, this is a bigger machine, and uh, luckily he ended up breaking the hose on the machine and didn't end up getting the ATM out of the building right here. Right, and we saw that yellow fluid that's down there, which is from the hydraulic fluid because that broke, right? Correct, yeah, that would have drained the tank. He, he busted one of the main lines. So, would that have inter interfered with the plans to get in that bank? Yeah, we, once the machine ran out of the oil, she wouldn't have done anything. Right. So that's Fairly, if you look behind us, uh, we've been checking it out. A fair amount of damage to this bank here. It's a sin. I mean, that's a brand new building. And you were driving by this morning, you saw this? Yeah, I was doing my self patrol. I do Dominion stores. So I left Stavanger Drive, which I had incidentally just congratulated the police officer because he's stopping operators in the middle of the night, driving back hose and loaders, and checking their ID to make sure they are who they are. Because if you got a master key, you can take any machine. So I congratulated them, and then I come out here and I see the lights up, and I was like, okay, there's something on the go. And then as, as just street over here, uh, Elliott Place, I saw another police car coming down, 
And I was like, well, there's something on the go here. And then I noticed it was a security card in front of the police vehicle. And I was like, damn. And then I looked over, seen the excavator inside the building. I'm like, oh my God. It's pretty opportunistic though to sort of notice that there, there's a, an excavator here doing a job and it just happens to be parked next to a bank. It's almost like recon these guys are doing. You know, it's like they're doing their, they're doing preliminary looks during the day and then come back at night and doing the jobs you want to hit. Now, as you know, Sean, this is the third one in a week. of What the heck is going on? Well, it's put a fear into the industry. And uh, I did an interview yesterday with uh, Cecil here, and I told him we have gone to the dealer and had them program our items. Our, our machines now are programmed. If you don't put the code in, our machine won't start. And we, we encourage other operators and uh, contractors to do the same because that'll put an end to all the newer equipment being used to do this type of thing. All right, so there's a measure there, but what's this stuff about the one key fits all? I mean, doesn't that seem kind of foolish? Well, it's pretty, you know, companies have big fleets. If you have 10 or 15 pieces of John Deere equipment, so you have a universal key. Right. That makes it nice and easy. Nice and easy for everybody. Nice and easy for everybody, unfortunately. It's not usually, you, you don't usually get this mentality around the heavy equipment. You know, the guys are all pretty good guys. But this guy here, I mean, I don't know if it's, if he's got addictions or what, but something's driving him. Right. All right, well, in this instance, they, they were unsuccessful if it's more than one person or one person. Listen, I appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you very much. It's definitely more than one person. It takes more than one person, you know. There's an accessory vehicle that's been going around as well. So somebody's, it's a two or three man team for sure. All right, listen, I appreciate your insight. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Take care. Camera compromise. The Supreme Court says the town of Paradise can keep the majority of its security cameras rolling. We'll speak with the mayor coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Supreme Court is allowing the town of Paradise to keep its security cameras, but they say some of them have to be turned off during the day. The town has 89 surveillance cameras installed as a deterrent after a series of break-ins, but there were complaints that the town was collecting personal information through those cameras. The province's privacy commissioner felt that the cameras should be turned off. The town didn't agree. Now a court order says the cameras can keep rolling except for seven of them, which will be turned off during working hours. I spoke with the mayor of Paradise this afternoon. There was a, a compromise, but uh, we're very pleased with the decision overall anyway, mm -hmm. that we can keep our cameras on for the protection of our, uh, you know, our staff and our user groups. Uh, and our uh, assets because, uh, as you know, there's been several incidents around uh, the, the Avalon Peninsula, uh, you know, in the recent years and, uh, you know, crime has increased. So again, cameras are a big deterrent to that. We have 89 cameras. We have a lot of buildings and facilities like our soccer arts and all those areas around town or baseball uh, areas. Uh, you know, if you just start off with, say, four or five cameras in each area, it soon builds up. What did you think when the privacy commissioner came to you and said, look, you, sh you shouldn't have all of these cameras rolling all the time. This is an invasion of people's privacy. If you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. And the cameras are there for your protection. And that's how I look at it. There's a difference between cameras that are in public areas and the cameras that are in the staff only areas where yep. you're kind of watching your own people. Absolutely. Uh, so w there is a compromise uh, with those cameras. Can you explain how, Absol how that works? Absolutely. Uh, so we never ever recorded anybody's workspace and it, it was all done. It was a comprehensive policy uh, between staff and uh, union or senior staff and union uh, to develop the policy around the implementation of the cameras. We didn't just stick up cameras all of a sudden. Basically what the compromise is now is that in those staff areas where, like I said, we never ever recorded anybody's workspace, those cameras will only be turned on, I think it's seven of them or something like that, they'll only be turned on uh, after working hours to basically protect that space if somebody was to break in. The town of Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove is warning walkers of a dangerous washout on Marine Drive. The mayor says he first flagged the issue to the province last March, but so far, no action. Bert Hickey says it's scary stuff and it's only getting worse. The CBC's Gavin Sims met him in Outer Cove to see the damage firsthand. Right now we are uh, on Stacks Lookout Point here in uh, Outer Cove. So what did you make of it when you first saw this? Uh, scary. Uh, when we first saw it, it looked scary. It's got a lot worse. Uh, it looks really scary now. If uh, you can see, you know, you go down there, uh, you ain't coming back. So how, how dangerous would this be, I guess, for pedestrians and... Uh... Well, that, that, that's our biggest concern. You know, we have uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, in the evenings go for a walk here and uh, you know this time of year when it's dark um, our big concern that was brought to us by staff and it was been brought to us by residents that uh, you know someone walking up this direction could just not see this and so we did uh, put a sign here as you can see there and and here to the other one I think I don't know if the plow hit it or blew over but um, yeah, to warn the pedestrians uh, to keep out. Yeah, it's basically just a chute right down to the ocean. It's it's extremely dangerous. Yeah. yeah. How do you how do you make this safe, and how do you I guess reinforce this this stretch of land here now? Well, you know, I think that's that's something that engineers have to look at, and uh, and I'm not an engineer to uh, see what can be done, but I think. You know, our immediate concern is this this area has to be cordoned off some ways to protect anyone from walking these roads if they don't go over there. That's that's our immediate concern and uh, um, that's what we want done right now. Well, I'm by that one. There's many people in our communities who are looking at this case and and see how important it is. Innu elder Elizabeth Panashaway talks about the Innu's knowledge of caribou hunting as part of a constitutional challenge being made in court in Happy Valley Goose Bay.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Hearings have wrapped up for now at least on a constitutional challenge examining the Innu's right to hunt George River caribou despite a provincial hunting ban. The defense used knowledge from Innu elders this week to support their claim that the hunters had an aboriginal right to hunt the herd. Jacob Barker spoke with Innu elder and activist Elizabeth Panashaway about her testimony and her son Peter Panashaway offered the translation. She said that the issue is that uh, we have a, we ha we've had a right and we've always had a right to uh, hunt caribou and uh, the right is now by law is taken away from us and so it's important for us as a community to tell our side of the story and why we why it is important for us and why it is essential for us to have access to the, to the caribou. She said it's important to protect our uh, inherent rights as a people, and it's important to show that we uh, support each other. This very important case, this is an Aboriginal right on the right to have access to caribou, and so it's important that uh, elders, young people, uh, show their support. There's many people in our communities who are looking at this case, and and see how important it is because our rights to to hunt and fish is on the line. This is an Aboriginal right. It's a, a historical right, it's an inherent right. So it's very important for us to send a message that this is about our way of life. There's a lot of um, things that flow from, from caribou. For example, caribou skin, which is made for moccasins, uh, drum food, medicine and that's why it's very important that the right continues because it involves uh, festivities it involves uh, the language it involves the culture it involves the the, the 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 drumming the dancing and so all of that is in the court right now we're being told all of that is illegal and we're saying no it's not illegal it's a right that we've always had and we want to continue to have that right there are people uh, that are critical of the Innu hunt. Uh, the rules have also been made, they say, to protect the herd. Um, what, what do you say to that criticism and those concerns for the, for the caribou herd? For her, it seems like government is looking to blame someone, and Innu are an easy target. Government has to take responsibility as well. You have uh, Muskrat Falls, you have uh, mining developments in West, Lab West, you have Boise's Bay. All these um, um, resource developments have an impact on the, uh, on the habitat of, uh, of caribou. And so governments have to take responsibility as well. You have to take a look at these uh, resource developments. How much of an impact it has it, uh, does it have on the caribou? And, uh, to, agenda, and to say, you know, that uh, we'll point the finger at the Eno is, is wrong. Well, two federal ministers took time away from the Liberal cabinet retreat in Sherbrooke, Quebec, to meet the family of a missing Canadian woman. Edith Blade disappeared in Burkina, Fa Burkina Faso a month ago. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland and International Development Minister Marie-Claude Bibeau met with her mother and sister who live in Sherbrooke. We had a, a good conversation uh, between mothers. We talked about is it. I know that they are confident that we are doing everything that has to be are done, but I cannot with, tell. Are you in touch with authorities in Burkina Faso? Of course, we're, we are in touch, but I mean, this is as far as I can go. Thank you. 34-year-old Blay and her Italian friend were supposed to do some volunteer work with an aid group. Burkina Faso's security minister has referred to their disappearance as a kidnapping. Earlier this week, another Canadian, Kirk Woodman, was kidnapped and killed. We're learning more about the car crash involving Prince Philip. The Duke of Edinburgh was behind the wheel of his Range Rover yesterday near the Royal Sandringham Estate when the vehicle hit another car and rolled over. Investigators say the other car was carrying two women and that also a nine-month-old baby was on board. Now, the child was unhurt, but one of the women was treated for minor cuts. The other broke her wrist. Prince Philip, who is 97, was not injured. A witness helped him get out of his car. How's it going? It's going for her. Hello, son. 
Well, congratulations to Debbie Swires of Logie Bay for scoring tickets to the hometown performance of Come From Away. Now her husband will finally see the show. Yep, lots and lots of listeners entering that St. John's Morning Show contest with uh, Chrissy and Fred. Congratulations to you. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Uh, well, earlier in the show, we said we'd uh, give away a pack of those beautiful Fairyland stamps. Yeah, and actually, Anthony has just gone to get those <laughs> stamps. Uh, they're upstairs. Uh, they were released uh, this Here he week. Comes. He's Here running. he comes. Here he comes. <laughs> Can you get around here somewhere? Here he is. <laughs> <laughs> here they are. Oh, Sorry there you about go. that. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful stamps. Yeah. Yes, they were released uh, this week by Canada Post, and they feature a gorgeous photo uh, by the photographer uh, Michael Windsor. Mm -hmm. And we asked where you can find more than 3,000 of Michael's photos. The answer? Right here in St. John's, a lot of people tweeting you too, Oh right? my goodness, yes, a lot of tweets uh, uh, there for sure. Uh, the Alt Hotel was the correct answer, mm -hmm. and Christina Gillingham tweeted me first with the correct answer. So thank you, Christina, and congratulations. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, was... we had the phones ringing upstairs, people calling in. <laughs> um, this was not a call-in contest, <laughs> no. uh, so we'll go try that some other time. Are you time. okay? Are you out of breath yeah, there? Yeah, well, running up there. Guys, yeah, we put a phone right here next time and do it live and see yeah. what happens, right? Yeah, it's a good idea. So, Christina, I'll have to get in touch with you, uh, I guess, through direct yeah. message now, there, and figure there, out how we're going to get them to you. There so. are six stamps in this amazingly generous prize package, but unfortunately, we're going to have to use one to mail <laughs> them to you, so you're probably only going to get five, but... Well, they're international no, stamps. they're international stamps. Are they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so if you live like in the states, <laughs> anyways. Yeah. So Ashley, the weather. <laughs> yes, good segue. Icebergs are cold. It's cold out, Ashley. It is. It's cold out. Uh, Sunday is what we're gonna look ahead to because uh, we are in for a pretty major storm as we head through the day on Sunday. Great. So the first half of the day actually doesn't look too bad. We'll take a look at the future tracker overnight. Things will be nice and clear, and then that's when it. 
things start to get a little bit uh, more cloud cover through the afternoon on the on Sunday. So we'll see that system move in. It's going to start as snow for most of central, western and northern Newfoundland, especially along the south coast as well. That will track further north towards Labrador, and then that's when we start to see things get a little bit messy. So we're looking at uh, a changeover through ice pellets to freezing rain, and that's denoted by these uh, pink color here. A pretty significant amount of freezing rain is possible from essentially the west coast through to the Bayvert Peninsula. We could see some uh, more freezing rain as well through parts of central. And then everything changes over to rain. That's when we're gonna see those temperatures really climb up. So here's what I'm thinking. Uh, snowfall wise everything in Labrador should stay as snow heavier snow along the coast and then we've got the strong uh, winds accompanying this as well so into the afternoon on Sunday it doesn't look like it's going to be very good especially uh, along the west coast in through the afternoon so uh, travel conditions quite poor and then everything changes over to heavy rain rain for the green area here and then mostly rain for the Avalon and Buren Peninsula we could see some freezing rain with the onset of this precipitation as well we'll see this though towards the afternoon on Monday so here's a look at your forecast on Sunday those temperatures are going to be sitting in the minus double digits overnight into the afternoon. We'll climb up to about minus nine for Cornerbrook and then Gander at minus 10 through the afternoon. Otherwise, we're looking at that flurry, the flurries for Labrador and cold again for Lab City at minus 31. So looking ahead through the day on Monday, there's that change over heavy rain at times along the west and south coast heading towards the Avalon as we head through the day on Tuesday. And then in behind that, everything will change back over to snow and then uh, heavy at times through the night on Tuesday into Wednesday. So the system is sticking around right through uh, midweek next week. And then another system rolls in on Wednesday evening. And again, it's looking like a one, two, three punch uh, through the next couple of days. So here's a look at the forecast that roller coaster temperatures. I keep saying it, but that's exactly how to depict it. Uh, minus six on Sunday, Monday up to nine degrees. And then looking at those windy conditions, uh, not going to throw out accumulations, but uh, mainly rain for the Avalon in eastern Newfoundland. Central Newfoundland will see uh, minus 11 on Sunday and then a balmy 10 degrees on Monday. So make sure you you do clear out those storm drains. That's certainly a uh, priority for sure. And then same thing for Western Newfoundland. We'll definitely take a look at this forecast as we head on Monday uh, because things could change as far as that track is concerned. Eastern Newfoundland looking at snow for Monday. Look at those temperatures climbing to minus eight by the time Tuesday rolls around. And then we're going to stick with these cold temperatures at least through Sunday for Western Labrador. Then we start to see that moderation heading towards the midweek. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, if the news of all of that impending weather has you feeling stressed, uh, the next video should calm your nerves. Yeah, I was thinking the winner of the contest might actually want to live somewhere else, so the international <laughs> stamps will help. The latest Newfoundland <laughs> tourism ad is out, and it's oddly soothing. In the quiet of the morning calm, where the sun rises at the dawn, and the birds sing their waking song. There's a story to be told. It rounds the corners and the cliffs, past the dories and the skiffs. After making its rounds through the lips of a teller from Forto, there's tales to be told of fairies and trees of ships that wrecked in the northeastern breeze, and of giants brought down to their knees by the beauty of this place. You never know where stories will appear. Could be aboard a boat or atop a pier. But one thing remains abundantly clear. It's worth the time to listen. So if you hear a teller telling you a tangled tale, or maybe two, rest assured, every word is true, especially the bits they make up. Makeup. <laughs> yeah. I mean
mean, good. I know we're biased, but those ads are fantastic. Yeah, just beautiful. I know beautiful. this summer people came from the United States and they actually said a couple of years ago, saw those ads, took a couple of years to plan, so I think they're really paying off. They're absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. Well, it's that time of the week. Yes, it's Friday, so it's time to find out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Phyllis and Ron Peddle of Chance Cove, Trinity Bay. And congratulations to John and Jenny Poole of Georgetown, who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. And happy 101st birthday to Molly West, who celebrate, celebrated rather on January 9th. Molly is from Ladle Cove and now lives in Gander. Birthday wishes going out as well to Ellie Vitch of Holyrood. She turns 98 today. And happy 100th birthday to Ned Abbott of Ragged Harbor. Love from family and friends. Birthday greetings to Nora Bradley of Eastport, who turned 92 on Wednesday. We're told that Nora is a regular viewer of Here and Now, so thanks for that. And happy birthday to Elva Rideout of Cornerbrook. She turns 101 on Sunday. Happy 90th birthday to Evelyn Genge of Anchor Point, now living in Flowers Cove. She celebrated on the 15th. Happy anniversary to Rosie and Abe Cake, who celebrated 69 years of marriage yesterday. They live in Porta Basque, and tomorrow is Abe's 93rd birthday, so happy birthday too. And happy birthday to Ted Patey of St. Anthony, who celebrates his 93rd birthday tomorrow today. And birthday greetings to Elsie Bowers, who is celebrating her 94th birthday. She lives in Botwood. And a happy 90th birthday to Charlie Sturge of Mount Pearl. He celebrated on the 14th. And happy birthday to Nellie Greenham. She turned 94 yesterday. You see her there with her great granddaughter. And a happy 93rd birthday to Ron Reardon of Mount Pearl. You can see him there curing his salt fish. And he's been volunteering at St. Patrick's Mercy Home for the past decade. And a happy 90th birthday to Violet Snow of Norris Arm. Now living in Lewisport, her birthday is this Sunday. Happy 91st birthday today to Walter Chaffee of Musgrave Town. Best wishes from family and friends. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Ted and Louise Ryan of Monroe. They celebrated on the 13th. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Phyllis and Ron Peddle of Chance Cove, Trinity Bay. Love from family and friends. Happy 52nd anniversary greetings to Junior and Judy Wells of Mount Moriah. And another golden anniversary here. Happy 50th to Phyllis and Bill Rose of Mount Pearl. 
Bill and Hattie Butt of Fortune are celebrating 63 years of marriage. Happy anniversary. And congratulations to Roy and Charlotte Wolfrey of Lewisport who celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary yesterday. Congratulations to Alethea and John Peddle of Cornerbrook. They are celebrating 59 years of marriage. And congratulations to Jeffrey and Maisie Noseworthy of Botwood on their 58th wedding anniversary. Anniversary greetings going out to Wallace and Ruth Brown of Glenwood. Their 60th anniversary is coming up on January 21st. Happy 50th anniversary this Sunday to Eric and Linda Osmond of Gambo. Congratulations to Stephen and Myrtle Gregory of Paradise on their 54th wedding anniversary this Tuesday. Congratulations to Bill and Alma Rose of Marystown who will celebrate their 76th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Gerald and Molly Saunders of Gander. Anniversary greetings to Kenneth and Phyllis Roberts who celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary on the 16th. And happy anniversary to Cyril and Isabel Waterman of Gambo who celebrated 69 years of marriage on January the 10th. And happy birthday to Chess Bull of Eastport. He will be 99 years of age tomorrow. He's a veteran who served with the Royal Navy. Well, here's your weather photo for the day today. Mm. That oh. one should be in the NL Tourism. Could be, or a stamp. Or a stamp. Yeah. Or both. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> the Twin gate? Yes, it was. Good job. Beautiful. Absolutely. The Beautiful. The day, the day you don't ask is the day I get I it. I know. Yeah. yeah. Chris My Day life. at Back Harbor. Thank you so much, Chris Tuck, for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca, and we will get them on the show. All right. Excellent. Quite lovely. Yeah. So, Ashley, this weekend, shovel, salt, a umbrella. Bit of both, all of no, no umbrellas. Okay. It's gonna be really windy. All right. Windy. Yeah. Okay. Definitely Perfect. no umbrellas. Yeah. Definitely. See what happens on Monday with the storm. And yep. Try to keep that updated. I actually have a Facebook page now, so if you want to follow that, it's uh, facebookcom slash Ashley. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good night.